La diffusion vient de démarrer. Tous les participants sont en mode écoute seul. No, that's not what I wanted. We're going to have to start again. <laughs> okay. You can, but, you can probably, I'm sure okay. you can see my screen now though, right? Yes. No, but, yes. you, no, but you, you, see you no, but you press the, uh, the, the button that, uh, the, the, um, webinar starts. So. Yeah, no, I, I, that's a lesson learned. So it, I won't do that this time. But, okay. Can we, it's not a lesson. Be... No, 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 no. It was the real one. Two buttons, uh, Jennifer, there were two buttons. Okay. I clicked no, no, but twice. Now it's stuck. No, that's what we'll say. We'll just start over. No, but the link is gone now. Stop it. Jennifer, Stop the Jennifer, I don't know. If we use this, if we stop it and we use the same link, what is going to happen? I'm, I'm, I'm just starting to think. Um, oh. Can we just close this session and you send us another invite for the same session? No. Okay. Oh, but, but, uh, Bill, I see your uh, your mouse moving. Yeah, but see the, the 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 issue, Roberto, is that now the the presentation is actually running, not the the pre thing. So mm -hmm. so we've got to can't we've got to stop this and create a new one. Uh, to... No, no, because this is the link that the 106 attendees have. God damn it! Oh man! So Let, we can, we can just. We, can... But I. Hi, let me first tell you how happy we are to see so many of you gather for this webinar on the topic that we choose to present today. We are confident that your presence will contribute to the interest of the discussion this morning. Note that there will be a question period of approximately 15 minutes at the end of the webinar. During the presentation, you can please write your question in advance in the question box at the right of your screen. There you go. I'm giving the floor to my colleagues who have kindly agreed to speak to you about this subject today. Bill Balapendo, Sales Engineer, Business Development Manager for the Northern USA at Rockstest since May 2015. He has a 20 years of experience in instrumentation and a background in geotechnical consulting engineering. Roberto Valder, Sales Engineer at Smartech in Switzerland since January 2000. He works in sales with a specialization in the development of markets and sales channels. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Jennifer. Good morning, I'm Bill Villapando. I'm here with my colleague, Roberto Valder from SmartTech to present this morning's webinar on the use of fiber optics for structural health monitoring. This morning, we're going to be covering a couple of a couple of the topics. Uh, I'm going to first give you a brief rock test overview, followed by an introduction to fiber optic sensors, then moving on to detection using distributed fiber optics, followed by distributed fiber optic application examples, the DTS, DTSS equipment, and then finally selected case studies. Uh, on the next slide, I'd like to present a brief overview of our organization. So as uh, part of the Nova Metrics Group, RockTest was founded in 1967 in St. Lambert, Canada. We've got uh, manufacturing facilities in Canada and Switzerland, and we've got a presence in over 100 countries worldwide. Uh, with several acquisitions over time, Group RockTest is now comprised of five divisions, all operating under the Nova Metrics umbrella. On uh, the following slides, I'd like to present a brief overview, uh, an introduction to fiber optic sensors. Uh, so in this slide, you'll see a cross-sectional graphic of a typical distributed fiber optic cable. The central element here shown in, 
in uh, light blue. It's called the core. It's comprised of a single silica glass fiber. It's the section of the cable where the light source is confined. Um, moving outward, you'll see here in dark blue what we call the cladding. Um, the cladding is also comprised of a sil uh, silica glass fiber. Uh, and the, what's important here to know is that the interface between the core and the cladding acts as a mirror, confining the light source and guiding the light down the fiber trunk. So this mirrored characteristic is due to the differences in uh, the reflective indexes between the core and the cladding. Uh, further moving outward, you'll see the protective and shielding layers. And then finally out here in orange, the PVC cable jacket. Uh, when I spoke about the, the uh, interface between the core and the cladding, you can see clearly here uh, the confinement of the light source. Okay, uh, in this graphic, you're gonna see the three basic types of fiber optic sensors we offer. Um, the first one is the single point sensor. Uh, the single point sensor relies on a single backscattered source. And these sensors are similar to the similar to traditioning traditional instrumentation like vibrating wire and LVDT in that uh, each sensor has its own individual signal cable. Uh, moving down, you'll see the next type of sensor is the multipoint or quasi-distributed sensor. Uh, this sensor offers multiple sensing points with multiple backscatter signals along a single run of sensors. And this type of sensor is typically suited to small to medium sized structural geotechnical applications. Um, the third one, and the one that we're gonna be concentrating on this morning is distributed sensing. Um, this technology offers continuous backscatter monitoring along its entirety, uh, where the cable itself is a sensor. This type of technology is best suited to large or very long geotechnical projects like tunnels, dams, levees, pipelines, and bridges. On the following slide, so we'll take a, a bit more in-depth look at distributed sensing. Okay, so uh, in this slide, you'll see uh, a typical layout for for health monitoring in, a, in an earthen dam. Uh, you see we're we're monitoring for pressure and temperature, uh, but what's glaring here is the distance between the sensors. Um, the layout of sensors here is typical of most, most point sensor layouts. And because of budget constraints, most of these projects install sensors only in uh, potential critical zones. But it begs to ask the question, what happens when, the, when an event occurs outside these critical zones? As you can see pretty clearly in this slide, this scenario is playing out. So you can see in between the sensors, we've got potential issues, maybe a leak here, some cracking or deformation over here. Same thing here, another bit of deformation or a crack and some seepage perhaps at the bottom of the, toward the toe of the dam. Um, one of the downsides to using traditional sensing is that the, the single point nature of the sensors themselves requiring a lot of guesswork as to what's happening between the sensors. Uh, you can see in the graphic here, the look just this, the, the large physical distance between the sensors. Um, Another downside to this uh, method is cost. Uh, to adequately evaluate a large structure like a dam would require you to, uh, to install an extremely large amount of sensors on the structure, making cost a primary concern for both materials and for installation. Okay, so uh, in this slide, you'll see pretty clearly that because the distributed sensor cable itself is the sensor, it's shown here in red, um, that the dam can be completely covered fairly economically. Um, using DTSS, we can monitor the soil for deformation using strain and for leak detection using temperature, all to a spatial resolution of about one meter. Um, we can monitor the dam using distributed technology in a way that would simply be too cost prohibitive for um, traditional sensors. Um, remember each sensor in the traditional sense is one that has its own signal cable requiring its own installation effort can get fairly expensive fairly quickly. Okay, um, 
the attributes of the distributed sensing system are, are many. Uh, the biggest one being continuous monitoring over its entire length. Allows you to know the, pre the precise location of the reading, the type of data, whether that be strain or temperature, the magnitude of these data, and the precise time the events occurred. As I said before, the cable has a spatial resolution of one meter, thereby giving the end user a data point every meter. Um, also to note is that because the distributed fiber has no moving parts, it's designed with a lifespan of about 30 years, maintenance costs for this system are extremely low. So in the next few slides, we're gonna discuss uh, several distributed sensing applications. Okay, in this graphic, you can see uh, some of the other typical applications for distributed sensing at the top here. Um, at the top left, you'll see an example of integrity monitoring for a suspension cable. But also possible here are, are measuring for uh, bridge deck deformation, tower deformation, and strain in the uh, vertical cable stays. Um, Moving clockwise, you can see a canal or perhaps a levee. It's being monitored for physical deformation, for seepage, and for overflow. And then on the top, or in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a tunnel being monitored for wall deformation and leakage. Uh, this slide's a, a pretty good example of uh, monitoring for long and large infrastructure. In this instance, it's a bridge deck for uh, deformation monitoring. Um, during the installation, the cable is uh, pretensioned so that we can measure both tensile and compressive forces. Um, in this instance, you can see here a pile cap that's that's exhibiting some settlement, and uh, the consequent the consequenting compression of the cable shown here. Um, this next graphic, you can see another example of long infrastructure monitoring, this time a tunnel. Um, you can see that the distributed fiber is snaked across the tunnel and across the tunnel crown, and it's spanning several potential problem zones. The graphic also shows uh, typical data flow from the project back to the end user, first to the die, the die, te uh, die test in interrogation unit, then remotely uh, by either the landline or cellular modem or even perhaps um, a hardwire connection like Ethernet, and then back to the end user's workstation. Uh, okay. Um, in this example, we're looking at a we're looking at soil deformation and a slope adjacent to a rail line. Um, here, the fiber would would be buried in the embankment as either a retrofit or perhaps in uh, new construction. Um, in this instance, you can see to the left side of the graphic here the sloughing of the the distributed fiber. The sloughing would be reflected in in strain changes at the end user's interface. Um, once the changes move beyond the threshold set by the client, um, warning messages would be sent out in, uh, immediately to all key personnel for corrective action to be taken. Um, you can see pretty clearly by using distributed fiber here that we can snake it through the entire slope, uh, allowing for pre precise location of the problem zones. Okay, um, in this slide, you can see another good example of long infrastructure monitoring. Uh, in this instance, the pipeline, uh, you can see the two different aspects of distributed technology. Um, the first one is strain monitoring, uh, such as occurring in sort of lateral ground movement or in a settlement or heave scenario. You can see that played out here and here. Uh, the other aspect is temperature monitoring. So when monitoring for leaks or in a situation where the pipe itself has been unearthed, exposing the pipe to ambient air, uh, the result in temperature changes would be seen immediately and, and uh, reflected on the user interface and also alarms would be sent out. 
Okay, for the, the next section, I'll be turning over uh, the presentation to, to my colleague, uh, Roberto. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. So let's, uh, let's see the, uh, the technology more, uh, more in detail. So this uh, technology has been around now for more than uh, 25, 30 years. At the very beginning of its deployment was actually the oil and gas industry that uh, started intensively to promote for uh, reservoirs, wells, and downhole monitoring, and later also for pipelines. It is now uh, 20 years that uh, the, uh, the same technology is used for uh, civil and geotechnical requirement. So a distributed um, monitoring system is uh, built up on a sensing cable and the reading unit. So the uh, reading unit is used to uh, generate the uh, light signal injected in the uh, sensor to collect the uh, backscatter light and to analyze it. After analyzing the backscatter light, the interrogator is able to show results in terms of temperature and strain, store data, and if necessary, send them everywhere using a standard TCP IP protocol or other data transfer techniques. Backscatter line provides measurement point every meter along the cable. Therefore, we can sense everywhere along the sensing cable and localize defects. The Dynatis interrogator has uh, a measurement range up to 30 kilometers and more, and uh, it can detect uh, and localize change in the strain and the temperatures. The advantages of the distributed technique include a large number of monitor points over a single optical fiber sensor, high resolution and uh, accuracy. So the, uh, the scattering process is uh, an intrinsic property of the propagation of the light in the silica material from which the, uh, the sensing fiber is made. The uh, analysis of the backscatter line consists of the combination of uh, first the use of pulse light that enables the uh, localization of the event along the, the fiber, and secondly, a spectral analysis of the scatter line that provides the uh, temperature and strain information along the, the, uh, the fiber. So, what you can see here is the uh, a typical uh, frequency domain of the scattering process used for sensing applications. So you see the, um, the railing component, uh, which is a pure distributed reflection with a random amplitude, then the, uh, the Raman scattering magnitude, that is, um, which is uh, temperature dependent, and finally, the uh, Brouin sh frequency shifts that are temperature and strain uh, dependent. So the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Brillouin interaction results in the uh, generation of scatter line, which experiences a frequency shift through the, uh, the scattering process. So more in detail, the Brillouin frequency shift is directly proportional to the acoustic velocity, which in turn is directly related to the material density and temperature of the fiber. <clears throat> so the, uh, the frequency shift depends line linearly uh, on the fiber strain and uh, its temperature. So if we move uh, forward, we can see uh, so the, the analysis of the, uh, of the backscatter lines. So actually the, uh, the whole process of the analysis uh, is actually the uh, combination of a frequency domain analysis and a time domain analysis. So the frequency domain analysis provides the, uh, the temperature and strain information along the uh, fiber, while the, uh, the time domain analysis enables the uh, localization of the event along the, uh, the fiber. So the, the time domain analysis is a simple uh, principle, which is similar to the, uh, the time of flight. So the uh, localization of the measurements is possible through a modified radar concept using optical pulses launching the, in the fiber. 
So as long the uh, the pulses propagate throughout the uh, the fiber, the effect of the measurement on the, the optical pulses within the fiber is recorded as a function of the uh, of the time. Knowing the uh, the speed of the line within the optical fiber, the time delay between the pulse launch and the detection of the event provides a direct information on the location of the interaction. So this is uh, the, uh, the interrogator dye test uh, for uh, distributed strain and temperature monitoring. Uh, so you can see uh, the main, uh, the main uh, uh, specifications. Uh, the, uh, the accuracy of the instrument is given uh, typically by, by the setting of the unit. So that is how the instrument is set for the, uh, for the measurements. So the setting of the instrument is considering uh, four variables. So the acquisition time, the, uh, the spatial resolution, the absolute accuracy, and the, the measurement range. So the, uh, the four variables are depending on each other. And uh, the accuracy, for example, is the result of the setting of the other three variables. So in the, in the literature, uh, you may, we always mention that uh, the accuracy is 20 microstream as a typical value, but this actually can vary according to the, uh, to the measurement setting. So the, uh, the dying test uh, dual version, so BOTDA and the BOTDR mode allows the, uh, the reading in both loop and the single-ended mode. So the uh, BOTDR technique relies on the spontaneous Brillouin scattering. That is the, the original optical pulse interacts and scatters back spontaneously within the, uh, the fiber. And the uh, technique uses a single fiber and axis and has the uh, particular advantage that in case of cable breakage, so, for example, when the cable is already installed, is uh, maybe buried in the in the soil, it would be possible to resume the total cable length by measuring via the opposite direction of the cable uh, loop setup. So the um, <clears throat> the diameter short short uh, range is the uh, the new entry level interrogator size. Uh, to meet the increasing demand for uh, distributed sensing. So the tightest short range shows cost and the performance optimized for a maximum length of the sensing cable up to five kilometers per, uh, per channel. Therefore, enable the uh, implementation of this technology for small uh, to medium scale monitoring uh, projects. So this, uh, this unit is indeed a uh, reliable and optimized uh, performance entry-level uh, Brillouin inter interrogator for, um, for short-range applications. So let's see now the, uh, the software, the DIDU uh, software. So this is uh, the, uh, the most important component of, the, of a monitoring system. So the uh, the DiView software has been uh, uh, specifically developed to manage distributed data generated from the uh, distributed systems, and it typically provides system uh, status report informing the, the operator about uh, the uh, the status of each single component, as the uh, the interrogator, the uh, the sensor, and uh, the the software itself. So it works continuously twenty four seven without uh, the need of an external operator and uh, when configured the, uh, the software uh, can trigger alerts to a dedicated uh, user. Warning thresholds are typically set during the, uh, the system commissioning and it provides an easy remote access to the, to the system offering remote uh, troubleshooting and offline data uh, processing. It also offers a friendly user interface with data uh, display maps. 
And the uh, algorithm that uh, supports the, uh, the software is uh, particularly robust against false alarms caused by uh, outlier values or noise measurements. And it allows the, the whole system being sensitive to the uh, environmental influences and uh, unwanted uh, variations. So the, uh, the DiView user interface uh, that you can see here an example is, uh, is designed to be user friendly and provides uh, an Im immediate indication of the global state of the system and uh, its components. So in order to uh, make the, the selection and the visualization with each particular point, it is possible to uh, zoom in and uh, zoom out by simply scrolling and have information on the, on the last measurements available or uh, blinking status referring to uh, uh, not knowledge warnings by the, uh, by the operator. So uh, let's see now the, uh, the sensing cables uh, family. So the, uh, the first one is the, uh, the smart profile. Uh, so this is a combined strain and temperature uh, sensor, uh, which um, which contains uh, two fibers for uh, strain sensing. So the uh, the blue ones, uh, then two fibers for data communication, the uh, the red ones, and uh, also two uh, fibers for the temperature sensing. So the uh, the green one. So the, the fibers are uh, encapsulated in a, in a polyethylene uh, profile. And uh, this uh, the smart profile is, um, is mainly, mainly used for uh, concrete uh, structures. So it, it can be, uh, for example, it can be uh, embedded in, uh, in concrete. What you can see here is the, the smart profile that uh, uh, has been affixed to the uh, to the rebar before uh, concrete uh, pouring, or uh, it can be uh, mounted on the uh, on the concrete uh, surfaces uh, by using uh, uh, glue, or it can be also uh, taped or clamped directly on the uh, on the surface. So the uh, the other tape is the, is called the smart tape. And uh, this is uh, a very uh, thin uh, tape and is suitable for installation on uh, typically, typically on flat uh, surface, in particular uh, steel uh, and uh, metal or uh, uh, composite materials uh, embedding. Uh, the, uh, the, fiber, the fibers are embedded in a composite uh, thermoplastic matrix tape with glass fiber uh, reinforcement that you can see on the on the right so the uh, the small uh, dots are uh, glass fiber reinforcement while in the center is actually the uh, the uh, the sensing uh, fiber and then okay well, finally we we have the hydro and geo uh, distributed cable this is uh, again a combined strain and temperature sensor so the, uh, the cable contains four single modes uh, fiber and two multi-mode fibers uh, to, to allow the, the sensor to be used both with the, uh, the diatis interrogator for distributed strain and also with the, uh, the diatom DTS uh, interrogator for temperature monitoring. So it's possible to discriminate uh, the strain from, uh, from the temperature and vice versa 100%. So this sensor is particularly suitable for uh, geotechnical applications with different methodology of installation, for example, direct burial in the ground, integration into geotextile, or again, surface installation in, for example, in uh, grooves. Uh, thanks to the uh, robust package design, the Adrian Geo cable offers high tensile strength, uh, crush resistance, uh, water tightness, chemical and uh, abrasion uh, resistance. So here you see uh, a couple of examples. So the installation of the Adrian Geo cable 
uh, again directly into the uh, the ground or embedded in the uh, in concrete uh, um, because of the uh, of its uh, robustness the uh, this this cable is widely used also for uh, downward monitoring like uh, boreholes uh, piles you know wells or uh, uh, ground uh, ground shaft um, monitoring so this is a very uh, robust cable for really very harsh uh, uh, deployments. So, okay, thank you. So I'm going to uh, to give the floor again to Bill, who will uh, end up the presentation with a few uh, project uh, examples. Okay, thanks, Roberto. Uh, in this next section, we're going to be starting to take a look at several project applications. All right, uh, the first project I'd like to discuss is a sinkhole project in Reno County, Kansas. Um, the on-site assets here were a rail line and a residential subdivision located over top of an abandoned salt mine. Um, salt extrication here was ceased in the earliest 20th, early, early 20th century, but the, during the extrication process, um, the mining left several large caverns. Uh, some of these caverns have co collapsed over time and sinkholes were formed above. Uh, the distributed fiber optic system was chosen as the alert system here because it allows for the simultaneous monitoring of just thousands of data points along a single buried cable. Okay, so uh, this detection system was buried to uh, approximately a meter and a half in, uh, in potential fa failure zones with an overall length of approximately four kilometers. Uh, after burial, the, so the soil is compact, uh, mechanically compacted to create a good bond between the soil, the soil itself and the cable for uh, efficient strain transfer. Uh, one, one issue that uh, they ran into here on, on site was that uh, during the installation, sort of overnight, uh, some rodents moved in and decided they had a had a taste for uh, distributed fiber optic cable. Uh, they chewed through the cable and uh, repairs had to be made. So we had to sort of think on our feet and and um, ha grab a new plan for keeping the rodents away. You can see on the top right is a Kevlar sleeve that they deployed um, over top as a protective layer on all of this buried cable. Okay, and this uh, this is a screenshot of the user interface. You can see the limits of the monitoring zone here in green. Um, the dive view software sends alerts that the cable deformation exceeds the alarm uh, threshold set by the client. Uh, you can see alarm levels here at the bottom of the screen, all in green. Uh, you can see here on the right-hand side a magnitude scale um, as the temperature moves outside the green to uh, orange, yellow, orange, and red. This is uh, an indication of the an increase in the magnitude of the of the strain itself. Um, at the bottom left here, you can see the residential area. Uh, moving from top left here to sort of medium right, you can see the rail line. Um, you can also see here called out by the red arrows, two sinkholes that we, that, that were discovered. Uh, this is the one that was on the opening slide. Um, on this graphic, you can also see uh, an old abandoned evaporation pond. Okay, the uh, next project we'd like to discuss is a new container uh, terminal in the Netherlands called Euromax. Um, in the graphic, you can see the construction of a new pier section in the terminal. You can see that here. Uh, of concern in this particular installation is the degradation of the backfill material behind, behind the uh, 2K walls that are going in on either side of this. Um, two lines of smart profile cable were embedded in the backfill material behind the K walls to detect and localize uh, soil degradation zones over the length of the pier by detecting strain changes. All right, a couple of highlights for this. Uh, in the graphic at the bottom right, you can see the the elevation of the, the water in the harbor. 
this is a tidal area so that there are um, tidal effects. Um, here you can see a good depiction of what's going on behind the K wall. Uh, this is the upper limit of groundwater elevation, and then in the soil embedded it are the two runs of um, smart profile. Um, top right, you can see the enclosure, and the two other photos, you can see uh, a good depiction of how the cable is laid out and then backfilled. All right, seen uh, here at the top left is a strain versus location plot. Uh, it shows specifically where along the length of fiber the strain exceedance has occurred. You can see it called out here in red. Um, you can see the corresponding strain event over in the user interface over here to the right, um, signified as the two red spots on the, on the graphic. Um, 2K as I mentioned before, two runs of Smart Profile were installed, and you can see that clearly called out in the two runs, the two parallel uh, green runs. Um, in this instance, 560 meters of cable were installed. Remember, this is monitored at a, a spatial resolution of about a meter, thereby giving the end user 560 individual monitoring locations uh, when compared to traditional instrumentation. Uh, remember, this is a fully automatic and autonomous system sending out alarm calls automatically. Uh, the next project is a, a pump storage hydroelectric facility in Switzerland. Um, in this instance, a, a penstock transports water from a collection reservoir down to the turbines at the power station. Um, during a scheduled uh, penstock inspection, a crack was detected in uh, a section of the underground penstock. Uh, subsequent in inspections of this uh, revealed uh, not only were there cracks in the penstock, but also the welds that were uh, in the, in the pen steel penstock itself. None of them were without uh, were 100 percent free of cracks, and they suspect that the the culprit here was. Uh, um, an earth flow occurring in the in the adjacent soil progressing at a at a geologically high rate of speed of about a half millimeter a year. Uh, they also suspect that uh, another another culprit for the welds felding, uh, failing were uh, some poor welding control during con the construction phase. Um, about 120 meters of the penstock were monitored with four runs of die test smart smart profile. And as you can see here, they were glued with epoxy to the to the uh, penstock walls. Okay, in, ter in terms of uh, site coverage, like I said, uh, about 120 meters of smart profile was installed. Um, and due to the flexible nature of this cable, uh, a loop configuration was installed. You can see that here clearly at the top left uh, photo, loop back on itself. Uh, um, here on the graphic on the left, you'll see that the location, the precise location on the tunnel itself of all four runs, and because it was looped, it's one continuous strand of fiber with no no uh, necessity for splicing. Uh, the bottom two photos, you can see uh, a, a good depiction of what was going on in the concrete access tunnel. Large crack here. Um, and in this instance, the smart profile was installed using um, metal and plastic clips. Okay, in this in this Bruan versus uh, frequency uh, or Bruan frequency versus distance plot, you can see where the cracking occurred um, along the concrete access tunnel. Each one of these views viewed peaks uh, corresponds directly to one of the cracks in the in the access tunnel. Okay, the next project I'd like to talk about is a bascule bridge in Gothenburg, Sweden. Um, the main concerns for this particular project was that the bridge is a really high value uh, structure. It's one of the three structures that, one of the only three structures that spans uh, both sides of the river. Um, the bridge was built in the late 1930s with low grade steel imported from another country. 
um, during a routine inspection, problem zones were discovered with cracks in this in the steel. You can see here, uh, clearly see a, a crack through uh, entirely through a steel member. Um, at the time of uh, the inspection, the bridge was planned to last another 15 years, but in its current condition, the, the bridge is uh, prone to failure and under repeated uh, traffic loads and corrosion. The solution uh, recommended was to use five runs of smart tape along the entire span of the bridge. Um, here you can see the configuration of smart, tap on, uh, smart tape on the support beams um, on the bottom right. Uh, you can see this corresponds to the support structure underneath the deck. Um, the recommended specica specifications from the, the designer were very stringent. You can see them listed here at the bottom left. Uh, the key specifications in this instance are the resolution was at the three microstrain, the limits of error were at 20 microstrain, and the interrogation, interrogation frequency for the entire project was every two hours. Okay, uh, in the plot we see here on the screen, uh, the main peak represents the average stress over the length of about a meter. Uh, the secondary peak here called out in red uh, rec represents a variation in the local stress caused by a crack. And this secondary peak uh, is caused by the delamination of the smart tape itself. Um, as, it's, as the coating starts to delaminate, it, uh, the strain changes and to the effect that we can see this secondary strain peak to localize cracks. So based on this technology, we can detect cracks down to about a half millimeter over the length of 100 millimeters. Okay, um, in this slide, we can see the, uh, the user interface again, reflecting strain data in all five runs of smart tape. You can see them here, runs B through F. Uh, are the instru instrumented support girders. Uh, run, uh, runs one through four are uh, transition zones. And over to the left in the, uh, in the table here to the left, you can see locations starting with N are to the north side of the bascule section. Locations starting with S are to the south side of the bascule section. Then at the bottom of the drawing, you can see a graphic that uh, is a reference drawing with, uh, it's drawn to scale with regard to the data above. Okay, the next project is an automobile tunnel in Switzerland. Uh, it's the A2 motorway, also called the Goddard route. It's one of the most important north-south transportation arteries in Europe and one of Switzerland's ba uh, busiest motorways. Um, Due to water accumulation behind the concrete lining, a portion of the tunnel lining collapsed in 2017. Uh, you can see that pretty clearly here. Um, further investigation showed that the cause of the issue was meltwater percolating down through the rock mass and collecting behind the lining. So a decision was made to monitor both walls of the tunnel with a smart profile. Uh, it was monitoring tunnel wall deformation to, with the purpose of predicting future wall failure. Um, in these failure zones, um, uh, a remediation effort was, was uh, put forth and they installed some drains back behind there to dissipate the water, prevent it from collecting. Okay, so in the photo here, you can see one line of uh, smart profile fiber optic cable. You can see that called out in blue. Um, any deformation uh, or, or crack formation due to hydrostatic pressure behind the lining would easily be detected. Uh, it's also worth noting that because, again, distributed fiber is very flexible, has a small bend radius, uh, that you can bend the fiber to any shape you need uh, versus simply having one solid line of uh, fiber, we can shape it. So you can see here that uh, we've bent it to cross over several several crack 
crack areas called out in red. Okay, to follow the previous slide, uh, strain variations in the localized section of the tunnel can be seen here in the micro strain versus location plot. Strain peaks here are called out in red and they correlate to individual cracks in the tunnel lining. Okay, so another uh, look at the, uh, the user interface. This time it's a, a, a plan view example of the strain data. Uh, again, color scale to the right in indicates the magnitude of the strains. Uh, two different sections of the tunnel were uh, instrumented in, in this case. You can see here to the right and here to the left. Um, the one to the right of the drawing uh, clearly shows that uh, there were two runs of smart tape installed, or smart profile, I'm sorry. Um, and the one to the left here is, is clearly where most of the exceedances occurred. Okay, the next project is a, is a gold mine in Australia. Uh, they were monitoring for wall deformation and settlement in operating tunnels and laterals. Uh, distributed sensing was used here to detect and evaluate mass rock behavior uh, throughout the tunnel matrix during construction and through operation. And the end goal was to increase the safety factor for the miners and also increase production efficiency within the mine. Um, the three main operating tunnels were instrumented with about 7,000 meters of hydro and geo strain and temperature sensing cable. Okay, uh, in this graphic you can see uh, in the dotted yellow line here the, the configuration of the hydro and geo cable. It occurs behind this shotcrete lining. Uh, you can see how it was installed by looking at the, the bottom graphic on the, the left. Uh, this is a, a wire mesh that the, the, the hydro and geo cable was uh, zip tied to uh, and then followed by shotcrete. Um, on the right hand side of the graphic, you can see a 3D rendering of the tunnel layout itself. Okay, the next uh, project is a platinum mine in South Africa. This is the, the Mototolo Tailings Dam. It's part of the, the larger Debroken Platinum Mine in, in South Africa in the Limpopo province. Um, the immediate area around Mototolo is uh, rapidly developing, in, developing into a, a major mining district with, with quite a few platinum and chrome mines cropping up. Um, as you can see that the terrain here is pretty mountainous. It's located, the tailings and impoundment is located up on the hillside. So the need for a sound uh, tailings impoundment and, and monitoring were, are pretty evident. Um, this impoundment itself is about 115 meters in height. It's got a maximum footprint of about 1.4 square kilometers and it's capable of storing 65 million cubic meters of tailings material. Okay, uh, is this another plan view graphic? You can see pretty clearly here that the the um, hydro and geo cable is 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 depicted in red. Uh, there's some elevation um, contours as well. Uh, about eight kilometers of hydro and geo sensing cable were uh, installed here. Um, but to note, uh, typical of 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 uh, tailings impoundments or, or landfill expansion cells, what they do is install the monitoring below the liner itself at the soil liner interface. Uh, monitoring here was uh, performed during the construction phase and also uh, the construction phase for quality insurance uh, and also uh, for structural integrity and leak detection during normal operations. Another view of the user interface, uh, measurements here are again carried out automatically and fed into the data acquisition software. Um, it's able to show the results remotely and also trigger alerts via their SCADA system at the mine or 
uh, text messaging, emails, or phone calls in case of any critical events. Um, and you can see the hydro and geo cable in green, uh, the magnitude scale on the right, and any alerts here at the bottom of the drawing. Uh, at the left-hand side of the drawing, you can see um, uh, what the instrumentation cabinet looks like, containing the fiber optic interrogators, uh, the server, uh, the battery backup and the communications equipment. Uh, and of note, uh, these cabinets are typically climate controlled, so um, no problem operating them in, in very warm or very cold environments. Okay, uh, the final project I'd like to talk about, it's one of our more recent ones. It's the Canarsie Tunnel uh, in New York City. Uh, this particular tunnel is a twin tube that connects Brooklyn and Manhattan um, as part of the MTA subway network. Um, of note here, this tunnel was damaged in 2012 during Hurricane Sandy. Um, quite a bit of seawater inundation happened and it damaged the damaged not only the tunnel lining but the the, the um, duck banks here seen down below. Um, the initial plan was to close this tunnel for approximately 18 to 24 months and do a complete rehab, but because of uh, public uproar, the governor had to commission a, com a committee to develop a new plan. So this second plan involved relocating the utilities higher up on the tunnel walls and encasing the dilapidated duct banks, the ones that were beyond fixing in these fiberglass reinforced panels. You can see them here in yellow. Um, a system of hydro and geosensing cable with a total length of about 4,000 meters was uh, affixed to not only the, the um, reinforced fiberglass panels, but also the uh, patent duct banks um, as seen down below. Okay, um, you can get a pretty good idea of what the, what the damage uh, looked like prior to, to uh, rehabbing it. Um, pretty severe uh, scouring. And to the right, you can see uh, an example of, of uh, the installation of hydro and geo cable to the patent duck bank. Um, typically, um, just epoxy or, or perhaps even tape is used in this type of an installation, but the MTA let us know that uh, they had a rat problem in their tunnel. And apparently rats have a taste for uh, uh, cable. Um, we had to we had to think uh, up a second plan. And what we did was installed over top of the epoxied uh, cable. We put a, a uh, another uh, an impervious epoxy layer, uh, epoxy resin layer over top of the cables to protect them from rodent damage. So. Um, of note here, during the design phase of this project, uh, sort of a proof of concept, uh, myself and another uh, rock test engineer installed a um, a demo so that the uh, so that the owner or the the consultants could get an idea of how it was to be installed and the type of, we, we we demoed quite a few different types of epoxies uh, so that the the um, powers that be could choose what products they wanted to um, use in the tunnel. So here uh, is a good shot of the um, the installation of the hydro and geo cable um, from a work train. Well, the photo on the right shows a pretty good detail of the hydro and geo cable over top of uh, the reinforced fiberglass panel, the interface to the patent duct bank, um, and then the protective resin over top. So. Of note, there was a bit of an elevation change between the, the, the reinforced fiberglass panel and the bait and duck bank. This sat up about three quarters of an inch uh, higher than the, the duck bank itself. That was the sort of the width of this uh, fiberglass panel. So we had to think of a, a sort of a bridging area so that the, the edge of the, the fiberglass panel wouldn't uh, act as a pinch point. So sort of one of the sort of workarounds during um, this this uh, this uh, proof of concept. 
So from start to finish, uh, this entire project took a, took a little under 12 months to do all the rehabbing uh, and the installation of this hydro and geo cable. But if you recall, uh, the initial estimate for this remediation was about 18 to 24 months with complete closure of the tunnel. Um, in the manner that they did it here, uh, they only had to close the tunnel on weekday, uh, weekday overnights and uh, selected weekends. Okay, so on behalf of my colleague, Roberto, we'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, our organizer, Jennifer. Excellent, Bill. Roberto, thank you for the presentation. We will now move on to some questions that some participants have asked. Let's start now by giving the floor to our colleague, René Debois, Sales Director at RockTest in Montreal. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, we do have a lot of questions, actually. Uh, won't be able to answer them all, but uh, small, well, lots of them were related to the cost of the, such a system. So uh, any idea how much would be a, uh, the cost for systems for a small or middle-sized middle project? Yes. Um... Well, if you see, if you look at the uh, the cost of a single component, the um, the diet is short range, which is an entry level uh, uh, system. Well, its cost is um, sixty thousand USD, and then for the sensing cable, we uh, we start from uh, seven uh, USD per meter up to uh, twenty USD per meter, and okay, this de depends on the uh, on the type of uh, of cable, uh, so if it's uh, smart tape or smart profile or um, or the uh, armor uh, uh, geo um, hydrogen geo, and then if we if we look at the um, at the projects, well, for a small uh, let's say small project like the uh, the penstock tunnel or the highway tunnel, uh, we are from eighty. Uh, to 100,000 USD uh, for permanent and automatic uh, automatic project, while for um, uh, more expensive project like the uh, the mining tunnel in Australia or the uh, tailings dam in South Africa, uh, we may range from 150 up to uh, 300,000 USD. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, maybe one or two more questions, and the other will be answered individually. So, uh, about Canarsie Tunnel, uh, how long did it take as far as the installation of the just the uh, monitoring system? Uh, okay, so the monitoring system, as I mentioned, uh, was installed uh, sort of sporadically. It was all based on access that the uh, MTA was was given the work, work crew. So, so it didn't happen consecutively. I'd say uh, in a, a, in terms of uh, man hours, it was probably about uh, maybe 80 to 85 man hours over the length of several weeks. Okay, and maybe one more about the same project, uh, about the epoxy, how long do we think it's gonna last? Well, um, we source this particular epoxy from 3M um, and we only source products that were listed as permanent. Uh, the design, was uh, st stipulated the spec said at least 30 years and um and that's what uh, you know we designed it for so at least 30 years all right thank you uh, i think that that's it for us uh, jennifer thank you once again bill roberto for your answers uh, unfortunately time goes by and we appreciate all the questions you sent us We'll answer your questions directly to each one of you by email in the outcoming days. Thank you very much, everyone, for taking time today and showing interest in our webinar. Hoping we can collaborate in future projects together. So if you have any question or for more information, feel free to contact us. Again, thank you. It was a pleasure for us.